All right. Good morning, Vail Christian Church. I'm standing here on a Friday, getting ready to preach a sermon to you guys, because on Sunday, I will be driving my friend Matthew Hinkle, some of you have met him, up to Portland um, for some surgery on his pacemaker. If you'd be praying for uh, safe travels and a safe surgery for him, that'd be appreciated. Sorry I couldn't be with you virtually today live, but I'm recording this message for that. Back, if we remember back two months ago, before spring break, when we were all together, we didn't know that that was our last time together. And it's given me feelings, similar feelings, to the times back in elementary school where we'd go on break for the summer. It's that we knew that was our last week. We had our goodbyes. COVID-19 has brought an early summer for a lot of us. I just got done with my last preaching class. This is my summer. And as a kid, I hated summer so much. I loved being at home with mom and dad. I loved not having homework. But I just, there's always something missing in my life whenever I wasn't in school. I, I longed really hard to be with my friends and be in community. And I longed to, you know, be learning. And so when summer came around, uh, there was time to despair. COVID-19 starting summer early has brought this similar idea of despair. Lots of questions, if you will, on what's going on, why is this happening? And when we look into it, we look into, I'm sitting here in an empty church recording a sermon for my church family, and there's Easter decorations all up. But we weren't able to have Easter here. And that reminds me of some of the questions and some of the uh, anxiety and despair the disciples might have had in the weeks leading up to Easter. Take this for example. Saturday night, Saturday night of Passion Week, the disciples are at this house party. There's a lady with this perfume, this way too expensive perfume, more expensive than probably we would ever see or have, this jar of perfume. And she goes to Jesus, and she pours this perfume, this expensive perfume, all over his feet and anoints him with it. And the disciples, they're, they're confused. They wonder what's going on. You know, they ask questions, but it's what Jesus says about this woman that really picks up their brain, really confuses them. He said that she's done an awesome thing because she has anointed him for his burial. Sunday morning, they get up, they go into town, and there's people, and they're praising Jesus, they're saying, Hosanna, they're saying, peace. Thank you for coming, peace, in the name of the Lord. They're laying down palm branches. They're laying down their coats for this man. And Jesus is, he's a king. He's coming in like a king. He's asserting himself as a king. And on Tuesday, no, Monday, he comes into the temple. And he cleanses the temple for the second time in his ministry. And he does this on what he calls the Melchizedek authority, a priestly king. He's acting as a high priest. He's acting like a king on Sunday and a priest on Tuesday. Tuesday, Jesus talks a lot about his own death. He keeps predicting what's to come. And Wednesday, things are quiet. We don't know much about Wednesday. It was a day of rest, maybe, for Jesus. But it comes to the part I want to talk about in the text, Thursday. 
Thursday, they are preparing for the Passover, and they finally get this time of community to eat together, to meet together, and have this holy meal, this Passover. And Jesus says, I have longed for so long to eat this meal with you. The disciples, when they go in, Jesus does something unexpected. He kneels down, and he begins washing their feet. And the disciples are confused because Jesus, he's, he, just, he was a priest, he was a king, and now he's a servant? He's not even a servant, he's the lowest of low servants, he's washing my feet? What did I do to deserve Jesus to wash my feet? And they are just confused, and they, they're protesting, they're saying, no Jesus, no Jesus, no Jesus. That's not your place. You're my master, you're my rabbi. You chose me. I should be washing your feet. But Jesus, he kneels down and washes their feet anyway. And the disciples, they have questions. Because he's talked all week about going away, and they're like, why is he going away? What's he predicting? And Jesus, he doesn't answer their questions. He, or he doesn't answer them with the answers they want. He answers them with the answers they need. Jesus knew that this was their last supper, but the disciples did not. The disciples did not know, just like we didn't know, that that Sunday back before spring break was our last Sunday together, that we wouldn't have Easter together. The disciples did not know that was the last time, that was the last teaching they would really hear from Jesus. They didn't know that that Friday, he'd be put to trial and put to death. They didn't know that. And in this, it's a beautiful teaching moment. This is the last time together. And Jesus opens up his teaching by saying, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Church, this would have hit the disciples' hearts hard. As in Jewish history, vineyards have always been a representation of Israel's work. And Jesus saying he's the true vine and that God's managing the vineyard, this gives them focusing in on that all of Israel's work has led up to Jesus. From Genesis 3.15, the first promise of a Savior, from God saying that he would uh, have an offspring of a woman that would the snake would strike his heel, but he would crush the snake's head. This, all this work, this vineyard, he is the vine. He is the incompetent. Com he is all of it. And by putting God as the gardener, and God over it, this next line becomes even more powerful. He says, the gardener cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so it would be more fruitful. I don't know how much you know about pruning. Uh, after working in uh, the Vale uh, FFA greenhouse and uh, for Kim Braniff at In Full Bloom and uh, working on Grandpa, working with Grandpa in the garden, I've got a little bit of knowledge about pruning, but the real question here, if we catch it, is not why is God pruning? We know that he's pruning to cut off the unfruitful, but the question is why is he pruning the branches that are producing fruit? Why would God cut back a fruitful branch? Well, why, this, this is the same question that's asked all over the place. Why does bad things happen to good people? Why is the persecuted church uh, in the world, the underground church, why are they so persecuted? Why these people that have such hearts for God and literally will go to the stake to be martyrs and live for their churches and just put his word on their heart and spread it everywhere, why 
Why are they persecuted? Why are they killed? Why does our church that loves meeting together, that need each other, why are we separated? Why is God cutting us back? Why does good things happen to bad people? And he says it. He says it in the verse. He says, While every other branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so it will be even more fruitful. He says, it will be either, even more fruitful. Church, hear me. Sometimes God breaks us in order to bless us. Sometimes God has to cut us back in order that we can produce fruit. The, the example Jesus is using here is of grapes. In grapes, if anyone grows grape, has grown grapes, they know they're a funny little plant that you have to prune them every year. And you have to cut back because grapes only grow on new growth. A vine that produced grapes beautifully one year, if left next year, would not produce. They only produce on new growth. And this is why sometimes we are cut back. So we can produce more fruit. This is why we see the persecuted church in Iran. I was reading an article in Voice of the Martyrs that said right now in Iran, right now in the world, through this COVID-19 uh, pandemic, persecution has just doubled and tripled. As churches, underground churches, are having to move into online and broadcasts are being taken down by governments, things are not good. But we also see that these places like Iran, for example, is seeing the fastest underground church growth movement ever, even among this persecution. This new growth is producing fruit rapidly. And it's not only producing fruit, but it's producing fruit that goes on and produces fruit. It's making disciples that make disciples. Pruning is just one piece of the puzzle, though. It's just being patient in the pruning and knowing that when we are broken, that there's a blessing coming in that through our struggles, fruit grows is only one part of this message. Right now we are apart. We must abide in the vine. Jesus had said he is the true vine. And in John 15 he says, You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as also I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. When we first started doing these online church services, when the government said that we had to stop our in-person meetings and go to an online format, the beginning of COVID-19, the church was booming. Everyone on Facebook, everyone was posting, God is conquering COVID-19. God is over COVID-19. God is holding this situation. And the number count in our screen, in the top of our screen, of viewers, they, the numbers were unexpectedly high when we started. But around Easter, it began to drop. And this reflected in our numbers. This reflected in the posts we saw. We started seeing less, God is in control, and more, we need to take control of the situation. We saw less, let's trust in God, and trust that he's doing something here. That this pruning is producing growth. And more, and more, we saw more. This doesn't make me happy. And so, I, I'm going to do what I can to stop it. I don't like this pruning. Church, two months ago we were all together. We are all together in this room. We are all in our church. And God, in his providence and wisdom, has separated us. Has separated us all over Vail, into Ontario, into um, 
Harper and Adrian and Willow Creek. He's separated us up. But he's also given us the advantage to meet those who don't live anywhere near Van. Through our online broadcasts, we are seeing people on from other countries, from other states, from other areas, from other parts of Oregon. Hey, our influence that was this building has expanded exponentially. And he has given us each, he's given us each new people that maybe we don't see every Sunday at church, but on Sundays, we see that maybe they're our family. Maybe it's um, whoever you call. Maybe it's a grandma and grandpa or a brother. While we are away from church together, we must stay in the Word. We must stay strong. We must keep our studies. And we must keep praying. I heard two really good encouragements today from my preaching class on prayer and on fervent prayer and the blessing it has on you and others. We must abide in the vine. We must stay connected to Jesus, even though we can't meet together. Like Stephen Dad said a couple weeks ago, we must be eating at home. We can be fed at church, but church is a place to feed. And now that he's moved church into our houses, we need to feed ourselves so we can feed to those around us and those that we see every day. We need to be so in the vine that Jesus oozes out of us. As we abide in Jesus, and we see this new growth, and we accept the prunings, and we use this to build our witness, and we just become fruit-bearing vines, we also we start to change. The last section in John 15 that I'm going to talk about, 9 through 14, says, As the Father loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy might be in you, and that your joy might be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love, no one has seen than this, to lay down one's life for his friends. We've all seen the movies. We've all seen the shows where a person volunteers and sacrifices their life for another. Or the buddy cop jumps in front of the other cop and takes a bullet for uh, his brother. And we, we cannot doubt that this is, a, this is great love. We see that Jesus did it. Jesus did this great love, and it's talking about this in the text. Jesus died for us. But what's even more important is Romans 5, 8 says, while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. Jesus didn't die for his brother. Jesus didn't die for his friends. Jesus died for his enemies, for sinners also. And this is a mighty love. However, I believe this love becomes even mightier, even more perfect when we look at the context of the situation. This is Thursday of Passion Week. As I said earlier, on Sunday, Jesus was calling himself a king. He was anointing, he was taking his spot as a king. On Monday, Jesus was calling himself a priest. He was using this Melchizedek uh, priesthood that he is both a kingly priest, a priestly king. To, to the disciples, Jesus was their rabbi. He was their master. But we see on this Thursday, during the Passover dinner, during the Last Supper, Jesus kneels down and he serves them. He lays down his master, his rabbi position. He lays down his kingly position. And he lays down his priestly position. All positions that he deserved and all positions he had. And he becomes a servant. He becomes the servant of servants. The foot washing was, was the job reserved for the lowest servant of the household. He became the low man on the totem pole to serve others. But more than this, Jesus also laid down more. Jesus 
He went to the cross to become sin. He laid down his sinlessness. He laid down his perfect relationship with the Father. The, the one that he, if we look in Scripture, he talks about all the time that he's proud of, that this, they've always been in this perfect relationship. He lays this down. He becomes sin. He becomes the one thing God cannot stand. He lays down his position and his power as the Son of God to serve us in the ultimate way by dying for our sins and taking our punishment. Church, Jesus is calling us to do the same thing. Jesus is calling us to lay aside our positions, lay aside our friendships, our social status, to lay aside our social media and all our likes and followers, to lay aside how we are thought of, our relationships. He's asking us to lay aside any power we have over anyone and to serve, to take up our cross, humble ourselves, and follow him, to become servants to the world, and to go into our homes and our communities and make disciples that in turn will make, turn around and make disciples. Jesus has freely given us this gift. And he asks us only to freely give to others. To abide in his love and show his love to others. His commandment. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love is no one that would lay down his life for his friends. Church, as we go on through the week, as we go on through this COVID-19 pandemic, despair. Let us have energy. Let us be energized and be positive as we trust in the gardener that he knows what he's doing and what he's pruning. As we be patient as he's pruning us so we can be more fruitful. Let us abide in the vine and be with God daily and do our Bible studies so that when people come to us that we can ooze Jesus. And let us lay down, let us lay down our lives for others. Let us become servants to this world. For freely we have given, and freely we have received, and we must give. Let me pray for you, church. Please bow your heads with me. Dear Lord, thank you so much for Vail Christian Church. Thank you so much for all the members and visitors and people on this live stream right now, Lord. I pray that you would be in their lives this week and that they would know that you are over the coronavirus. That you are the gardener and you know what you're doing when you prune. Lord, you have set us aside to be witnesses for you, God. And I pray that we would accept this role, Lord, and lay down our position and power. Humble ourselves and pick up our crosses, God. Thank you for the influence you've given us, Lord. I pray a blessing on the families, God. Thank you so much for all you've done. Thank you for your gift. And it's in your name I pray. Amen.